The next bill on the calendar for the day is House File 403. The clerk will report the bill. House File number 403, number three on the calendar for the day, an act relating to human rights, the first engrossment. The member from Ramsey, Representative Her, to your bill. Good evening, members. House File 403 is the Preventing uh, Pay Discrimination Act. This bill is about one thing, bringing us one step closer to closing the pay gap in Minnesota. Although we've made some progress over the years, the pay gap is still very real in our state. Across occupation and education levels, women still just only make 82 cents on the dollar for what a man makes. The pay gap is even worse for women of color and indigenous women. Asian women make 71 cents on the dollar, with Hmong women making just 55 cents. Black women make 59 cents on the dollar, with Somali women making just 44 cents. Native women make 56 cents on the dollar, and Latinas make 53 cents on the dollar. Over the course of a career, women lose roughly $400,500 in lifetime earnings because of the pay gap. But this is why we have the Preventing Pay Discrimination Act. House File 403 protects a job applicant from having to disclose their pay history when they are applying for a job or negotiating their salary. We provide this protection by ending the pay history question. This means that an employer cannot require or ask that a job applicant disclose their pay history when they are applying for a job or trying to negotiate their salary. I do want to note that a job application can, applicant can still voluntarily disclose their pay history if they want. And if they do so, an employer is free to use that information in salary negotiations, and they would not be in violation of this pro uh, policy. Ending the pay history question is a simple and common sense way to help close the pay gap. Pay history questions not only artificially anchor down a woman's pay, but it also means that someone can often not escape the pay gap by trying to get a new job. If a woman or a person of color experiences the pay gap early on, it can lock them into a cycle of pay discrimination throughout their entire career. This makes it more difficult to afford housing, health care, education, or other life essentials. But with House File 403, we can finally break this cycle and help stop pay discrimination. It will help ensure that Minnesotans are paid based off of their qualifications, experience, education level, or other relevant factors, but not what you made at your previous job. With this bill, we will join 18 other states that have ended the use of this pay history question. And these are politically diverse states like North Carolina, Colorado, Alabama, and Massachusetts, just to name a few. The results from states that have already implemented pay history bans show that they work. According to Boston University School of Law, states that have implemented pay history question bans saw an 8% increase in pay for women and a 13% increase in pay for, pay for black workers. It is time we join this movement and help close the pay gap in Minnesota. I do want to point out that the bill you have in front of you today received a 12-4 bipartisan vote in Judiciary Committee and a unanimous 12-0 vote in the Labor Committee. During Women's History Month, help close the pay gap in Minnesota. There is an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Scott moves to amend House Bill number 403, the first engrossment. The amendment is coded A2. The member from Anoka, Representative Scott. Um, thank you, Madam Speaker, and um, thank you, um, Representative Herr, for bringing this bill. And what this amendment does um, is it removes, um, to me, the most troubling part of this bill, and that is the language surrounding the rebuttable presumption. Um, I, first of all, Madam Chair, before I forget, I would like to have a roll call on this. Uh, Representative amendment. Scott requests a roll call. Are there 15 hands? Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Representative Scott. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And so if I might, I just, um, if, if uh, I'd like to explain the amendment a little bit um, and why I think it's important to remove this section. And then, uh, but I'd like to start by um, asking the bill's author to yield for a couple of questions. She will yield. Representative Scott. Um, thank you, Madam Speaker. And Representative Herr, um, I'm just wondering if you think that if we remove this rebuttable presumption, if this amendment goes on, do you think that this bill would still um, allow 
a, a an applicant for a job to still bring a lawsuit under the provisions that are left in this bill. Representative Herr. Thank you, Representative Scott, uh, for the question. So the rebuttable presumption language is necessary because it clearly lays out what the next steps will be if an employer is found in violation of the law. If an employer used the job applicant's past, to pay, uh, past pay to set their wages, then it will be their responsibility to explain why they did that. The rebuttable presumption language sets a clear standard for employers and job applicants. Representative Scott. Okay, well, thank you, Madam Chair. And I don't, I don't think there was an answer in there. Um, I just wanted a yes or no. If the rebuttable presumption is removed, if that language is removed from this bill, would an applicant still have grounds for bringing a case under the Minnesota Human Rights Act should the rest of this bill become law? Representative yes, Herr. Uh, Madam Speaker, Representative Scott, um, we think that the, I think that the rebuttal presumption actually makes the, uh, the bill language more clear and it sets better expectations. So um, I, I guess I know you're looking for a yes or no answer, but I think that it's pretty clear that it is important for this to be included in this bill. Representative Scott. Um, thank you, Madam Speaker. And if the uh, um, bill's author would continue to yield. She will, Representative Scott. Thank you, um, Madam Speaker. And um, Representative Her, I listened to the tapes of um, other committee hearings. I know this was heard in judiciary. And I listened to, um, I believe it was in a labor committee of some sort. And the commissioner stated that um, the the concept of um, rebuttable presumption is is just kind of a given in um, anti-discrimination law. And so what I did um, is I looked up um, uh, the, the statutes to see if that was indeed the case. I'm just wondering if you've taken the time to look um, in the rest of the human rights statutes to see if rebuttable presumption is in there. Representative Herr. Madam Speaker, Representative Scott, I did, and rebuttal of presumption is found in our statute that deals with reporting male treatment of vulnerable adults. They use rebuttal of presumption within the context that if facilities or businesses retaliate against someone for uh, reporting abuse, and then the rebuttal presumption concept applies, and the facility or business must explain why they retaliated against the person who reported maltreatment. Representative Scott. Um, thank you, thank you, Madam um, Speaker. I don't believe that statute is in the Minnesota Human Rights Statute. Um, I, I looked through this chapter that this bill falls under and it's nowhere to be found. And um, so I feel like the, the commissioner misled some of the committee members when she said that this was like the basis for, for um, this sort of law. And the problem with a rebuttable presumption when it comes to this kind of, uh, for this um, area of law, is that it kind of turns the American um, way of law on its head in that um, you are having to prove a negative. The plaintiff, it always, it, the burden of proof always falls on the plaintiff. And then with a rebuttable presumption, just the opposite is happening. And so my concern here, of course, is that, um, that this is not um, this is not a concept that is overwhelming in this in this in the Minnesota um, Human Rights Act, and that um, there's plenty of case law um, to prove that. And in fact, if you if you go to there's a there's a Supreme Court quote from um, the case is called Sigurdsson versus Isanti County. And it says, the ultimate burden of persuasion, however, never shifts, resting at all times on the plaintiff. And so what you're doing here with this, um, by adding this piece into this section of um, the Human Rights Act, and it's not, I'm like, okay, so why is, why are wages and, um, why is that so special as compared to all the other protections, categories of people that are protected under the Minnesota Human Rights Act? Why is there no rebuttable presumption in all those sections of law? 
um, if this is a concept indeed, as the commissioner quoted and as um, the bill's author um, really is, is dedicated to this language, why is it um, that it's nowhere else in the human rights statute? And in fact, the Supreme Court itself has said, the burden of proof always lies on the plaintiff. And in this bill, it's the the um, it's going to uh, the burden of proof is going to fall on to the the defendant in this case, and I think that we're headed down the wrong road with this particular language. Um, if if indeed the concept of rebuttable presumption is a standard concept in all of anti discrimination law, then the rebuttable presumption should be removed and the courts will automatically apply this analysis under the law, under the Minnesota Health Records Act in cases under this new law. So I'm not sure why this language is needed. Um, I agree with the bill's objective. I do, equal pay for equal work. There's not a person in this, uh, on this call or in this room in the legislature that would disagree with that concept. And I am concerned about the wage gap. I believe it needs to be addressed, but I think this bill could pass and still accomplish that without having this rebuttable presumption that basically turns American law um, that treats people um, when they go into court, not as wrongdoers um, and it, it turns that on its head. So members, I would, I would request, um, I guess I've requested um, a, um, uh, a roll call on this bill. And I would request that um, people support uh, this amendment. I think if people, if this amendment um, would go onto the bill and that section was removed, I think you would get a unanimous um, vote on this bill, Representative Herr. And, uh, Again, rather than placing um, an additional burden like this on our small businesses, let's focus instead on passing stuff that we can all agree to, like not taxing unemployment benefits and not taxing the PPP loans. Um, members, I ask for a green vote um, on this amendment. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Discussion to the A2 amendment. I wondered if the author of the bill wanted to address the amendment before I go to other debaters. So that's why I was looking in her direction. Representative Herr to the A2 amendment. Um, thank you, Madam Speaker. And uh, thank you, Representative Scott. And I do, I oppose this amendment. The amendment uh, effectively strips out the enforcement protection in this bill. I know you mentioned that, you know, we shouldn't put undue burden on small businesses, but I think about the undue burden that has been placed on people of color, on women, those who've had to carry the burden of being paid less for their pay for the same job and for the same education and the same experience. And so I'm thinking about that undue burden. What rebuttable presumption means here is that if an employer uses someone's pay history with the context of the, within the context of this bill, it will simply be their responsibility to provide a non-discriminatory reason for why they use the job applicant's pay history to set their wage. So ultimately, the rebuttable presumption language is necessary because it sets a clear standard for both employers and employees. Additionally, after good faith conversations with business stakeholders, we amended in subdivision E, which clarifies a number of questions that an employer can still ask, uh, questions in which the employer can still ask. So there really isn't a need for this amendment. Lastly, of the states that have passed their own pay history uh, question bans, almost all have included some enforcement mechanism for this policy. Many states chose a civil penalties route requiring thousands of dollars in penalties if an employer is found in violation of this law. We wanted to be less punitive, so we chose to go the rebuttable presumption route instead. I suspect that we would all rather enforce this policy through setting clear standards, which is what we have in House File 403 and not with civil penalties. Discussion to the amendment. The, the member from Wright, Representative McDonald. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Say, I just quickly rise to support the amendment, and here's why. Uh, in committee, in the Labor Committee, it did pass out unanimously. However, uh, many of my colleagues uh, did um, question the rebuttable presumption, 
And that was kind of the sticking point of a good lot of the discussion, a good part of the discussion, although a good bill, but that was the sticking point. And we did uh, uh, say to Representative Her that uh, that was our concern. And she did state that she would work on that as it goes forward to the next committee. So it doesn't appear that maybe that she did that. Perhaps she could correct the record uh, that uh, it didn't change the bill at all and kept that in there. But if Representative Her, if you could yield to a question and answer that for me, that would be. She will yield, Representative McDonald. Representative Her, in committee, we had good discussions and we all supported you. But as you know, there were many concerns regarding that uh, rebuttable presumption. And uh, you did state that you would work on that and uh, look into that for the next committee. So just curious as to, uh, what work you did do that to address uh, the minority's concerns? Representative Herr. Madam Speaker, uh, Representative McDonald, actually I did work on that. I worked with the Department of Human Rights to look through the rest of the statute. We uh, had further discussion with the businesses that we'd been in contact with, which is why we did amend some of the other language around questions that could ask to help alleviate them from being able to be held responsible if they did what they were supposed to do. And so, yes, we did work on that and ultimately decided that the rebuttable presumption would stay within the language. And so just because it stayed the same doesn't mean that I didn't work on it. Representative McDonald. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Representative Herr. I appreciate that at least you uh, stayed true to your word that you would work on that. It would have been great to notify us, uh, perhaps that uh, you weren't able to change it with our concerns, but uh, thank you for your efforts. And uh, unfortunately, I will be supporting this amendment. And I hope the rest of you do as well. The member from Dakota, Representative Garofalo. Madam Speaker, would Representative Herr yield for a question? She will yield. Representative Garofalo. Madam Speaker, Representative Herr, uh, something about me, I went to law school for half a semester. Okay, it didn't go well, right? So I don't, so can you just, can you tell us, for those of us who don't un fully understand it, what is, not in the context of this bill, but what is a rebuttable presumption? Representative Herr. Madam Speaker and Representative Garofalo, I appreciate what you're trying to do. I never went to law school, but I'm a fast study. So um, I've already explained what it is, and I, I guess I don't know how to make it any more simple when I went through what rebuttal presumption means, that it is if an employer uses someone's pay history within the context of this bill, it will simply be their responsibility to provide a non-discriminatory reason for why they used a job applicant's pay history to set their wage. As Representative Scott said, it puts the responsibility onto the employer. Representative Garofalo. Uh, Madam Speaker, Representative Herr, uh, I wasn't being sarcastic. I actually did go to law school for half a semester and dropped out. I wasn't trying to project my lack of knowledge in this area on you. If I was doing that, you would know, trust me. Um, would, the author, would Representative Herr yield for another question? She will, Representative Garofalo. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And, and Representative Herr, I just, not in the context of this bill, what, like the term rebuttable presumption, what is that? It's, like, it's different people are saying it means different things. Can you just tell us what it means? Not in the context of this bill, just what that term is. Representative Herr. Madam Speaker, Representative Garofalo, um, I can only talk about this in the context of this bill because that is the bill that is before us. If you would like to learn more about rebuttable presumption, you could probably go back to law school and finish that law degree. <laughs> well, Representative uh, Garofalo. Well, Madam, Madam She's Speaker. She's been taking notes. Representative yeah, yes. Garofalo. Well, Madam Speaker, Representative Herr, I, I didn't mean it that way. I'm sorry, but I'll, I'll take your employee guidance to me on going back to law school. I appreciate it. If you would just yield for one more question. She will yield. Representative Garofalo. Thank you. Madam Speaker, Representative Herr, Representative Scott said that it's not in the human rights statute anywhere else. Was she right? Representative Herr. Um, speaker and uh, uh, Representative Garofalo, it is in uh, discrimination law itself. Representative Garofalo. And Madam Speaker, Representative Herr, maybe I don't need to go back to law school. Thank you, Representative Herr. Uh, the member from Anoka, Representative Stevenson. I'm so glad I got to follow that because I, I did go to law school uh, <laughs> and uh, made it all the way through in, even. Uh, and I just wanted to say that there's been a lot said here about what a rebuttable presumption is and how unique it is in the law and who has the burden uh, in various cases that just isn't true. It isn't true that uh, in all cases throughout the law, everywhere you look, the plaintiff always has the burden. In fact, there is um, many instances of what we call burden shifting in the law. 
uh, where the burden shifts from one party to the other, depending upon what facts or evidence are put into place. And this is a classic example of burden shifting. The burden initially will be on the plaintiff to establish that pay history was used and received on an applica application for employment. You actually have to put evidence in that there was pay history collected uh, for the employer. In that case, then there's a rebuttable presumption, which means that we're going to assume that it was used with discriminatory intent unless you can prove otherwise. That's the burden shift. And that method of, uh, of law has been repeatedly upheld by the courts all the way up to the Supreme Court. It's not uncommon. It's particularly common in discrimination cases. And so I think that this law is uh, uh, not out of the ordinary. What it is, is a tough law. It's one that is meant to do what the author wants it to do, which is ensure that there's equal pay for equal work. And so uh, if, as some of my friends on the other side of the aisle have suggested, that they all want equal pay for equal work, here's your chance to prove it. Vote yes. Or vote no on the amendment, is what I should say. <laughs> the member from Ramsey, Representative Pinto. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, so lawyer pile on, I guess. I'll be real brief, um, but just want to make sure we're really we're clear about what's exactly happening in this sentence regarding the rebuttable presumption. Um, the person, the employee, first has to show that their employer has used their past pay history to uh, determine their future wages, salary, and earnings. So basically, have to show that the employer in setting the earnings for this current job is not based on uh, the nature of the work, et cetera, but that the employer actually went back and looked back at that past uh, past history. In that case, then yes, under this bill, uh, the uh, the employer then uh, is uh, is then determined to have an unfair discriminatory employment practice unless they can show um, uh, otherwise. And that I think we all would agree would agree to, uh, if in fact you have a situation where the the future pay is being based on the past pay. Then, uh, then in fact, it should be the obligation of the employer to have some good reason for that. Because at first glance, you'd say that does not make a lot of sense. It seems to be, in fact, an unfair and discriminatory thing to do. That's all this is set up uh, to do. I certainly agree with Representative Stevenson and others and urge a no vote on this. And I thank Representative Her for bringing this terrific bill forward. Thank you. The member from Anoka, Representative Scott, to your A2 closing argument. Thank, thank you, Madam Speaker. And just so many things here. So in this burden shifting that they're talking about, um, the burden, if, if they bring a prima facie case um, and then the burden shifts to the employer. And if the employer gives a non-discriminatory answer, the burden shifts back to the plaintiff. So in a case where, let's say an applicant comes and they, they volunteer the information about what their past pay was, but then later they bring a case like this. Um, how is an employer ever supposed to prove that the reason they did or didn't that they didn't hire somebody was because of a non-discriminatory um, reason? When I, I just I don't understand how an employer would ever prove this that they made the decision to not hire that person for another reason with this, um, with this burden um, shifting uh, in place. And I understand it goes back and forth in some cases. Um, I think part of the problem here is that in committee, um, there was some misleading um, and whether it was intentional or not, um, members were made to believe that this rebuttable presumption was in statute throughout the human rights um, uh, statutes. And that's just simply not the case. So I don't understand why we need this specific language in this case, but not all the others. If indeed, if this is the way that all Human Rights Act cases are, are um, handled. So members, this is a good amendment. The bill will still be enforceable whether this language is in here or not. It's still enforceable. A person can still bring a case. So members, please support the amendment. Um, and then we can have a unanimous vote on this bill. Thank you, Ms. Madam Speaker. The clerk will take the roll on the amendment.
Members voting remotely, please vote. Will the clerk call the names of those who have not voted yet? Mo. O. I. Bo, I. Daphne. Daphne, no. Daphne, no. Damoth. Damoth votes I. Damoth, I. Feist. Feist, no. Feist, no. Franzen. Franzen, no. Oh. F Franzen, no. Frazier. No. Frazier, no. Grunhagen. Grunhagen, I. Grunhagen, I. Houseman. Houseman, no. Houseman, no. Heinrich. Heinrich, I. Heinrich, I. Heinzman. Heinzman, I. Heinzman, I. Hertas. Hertas, I. Hertas, I. Mariani. Mariani, no. Mariani, no. Mason. Mason, no. Mason, no. Pearson. Pearson. Richardson. Ten, no. Richardson, no. Swazinski. Swazinski, aye. Swazinski, aye. Pearson. Pearson, aye. Pearson, aye. We please recall Franzen. 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 Sorry, right, I'm plugging it and then plugging it back in. I'm gonna go off of the VPN here. Franzen. 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 This is Representative Kosnick. Franzen is changing from no to I. The clerk will close the roll. There being 61 ayes and 70 nays, the motion does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Lucera moves to amend House File Number 403. The first engrossment as follows. The amendment is coded A3. The member from right, Representative Lucero. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The A3 amendment members is on the topic of political affiliation. And what this amendment seeks to do is uh, make political affiliation a protected class. And the reason I'm offering it as an amendment to this bill is we're dealing with uh, protected class and discrimination uh, topics and it's the same chapter in Minnesota statute. In recent days, weeks and months, we've witnessed uh, examples of uh, political retaliation. And I firmly believe that discrimination of any type should not be permitted 
including discrimination based on a person's political perspective, again, not being tolerated. I saw so there's a headline uh, and an article back from, uh, this was I think January 7th of this year, and just one line in an article, this is a Forbes magazine article where it says, and this is speaking about Trump, uh, though members that worked in, in President Trump's cabinet, uh, let it be known in the business world. This is a declaration from Forbes magazine. Let it be known in the business world, hire any of Trump's uh, fellow fabulists above, and there's a list there in the previous article, and Forbes will assume that everything your company or firm talks about is a lie. Know, that was a threat, a shot across the bow on, based on political uh, affiliation. And members, in this advent of social uh, uh, media and uh, increased technology and uh, just the ability to, to communicate in the digital space, uh, we see examples of employers looking up on LinkedIn. Uh, we see people potentially going after and losing their jobs. There's multiple examples of people getting docs and losing their jobs because of political affiliation. Uh, we've seen examples of people being deplatformed. And members, uh, I just firmly believe that people should not be denied jobs or livelihood because of the way that they vote. So I would encourage members a green vote to the A3 amendment. Point of order, Madam Speaker. Uh, the member from Rice, Representative Lippert, state your point of order. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Rule 3.21 states that a motion or proposition on a subject different from that under consideration must not be admitted under guise of its being an amendment. This amendment expands the scope of the bill, introducing a new protected class, so it's not germane and it's out of order. I find the point of order well taken. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Lacero moves to amend House file number 403. The first engrossment as follows. The amendment is coded A4. Representative Lucero. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And uh, let's try another one. Also on the topic of uh, discrimination, but this one is on uh, vaccination status. So we have seen <laughs> recent headlines uh, in multiple states uh, there was one in regards to the state of New York, legislation being offered uh, that seeks to require vaccinations. Uh, I'm looking at a headline right now uh, that the governor of Connecticut, uh, one line in the article reads, Governor Ned Lamont told National Public Radio listeners Wednesday that vaccination passports were something his administration was going to look at. And uh, members, one's vaccination status should not entitle a person to more or less freedoms. And so that's why I'm, I'm seeking to amend, again, it's the same uh, chapter in law, and therefore I think it is a germane uh, uh, amendment. And I have another headline here uh, in regards to technology. And this one is also from Forbes Magazine, and just one line, a coalition of health and tech groups, including Microsoft and Oracle, are creating internationally accepted digital health card. Well, we know members that Microsoft is Bill Gates and vaccine credentials as a condition to conduct commerce is something that we should absolutely not permit. And so again, what my uh, A4 amendment seeks to do is recognize the individual liberty of one's own bodily autonomy and that uh, this is not a, uh, an amendment, amendment that takes a position on for or against any particular vaccination of any disease. It's just simply saying that a one's vaccination status would be considered a protected class and therefore government, business, others would not be able to deny a person or discriminate against a person based on their uh, informed consent decisions on their own vaccination status. So I highly encourage a green vote. Thank you, members. Discussion to the A4 amendment. Point of, point of order, Madam Speaker. Um, the member from Hennepin, Representative Howard. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I raise to a point of order under Rule 3.21, motions and propositions must be germane, and I have advice. State your advice. <laughs> uh, similar to the last amendment, uh, the Lucero amendment is out of order because it expands uh, the scope of the bill. Uh, this bill is narrowly focused on employment issues and this would uh, expand it. I would I would hope it's also encompassed in a, a bill that Representative Lucero has authored, House File 
1244. Uh, members, I would hope that legislators would use their platform to educate and bestow the virtues of vaccinations, their ability to save lives, keep each other safe, and bring this pandemic to a conclusion. But that, of course, is not the subject before uh, us in this bill. And so I would urge you to find the Lucero Amendment out of order. Madam Speaker, just quick advice. Uh, yes, Representative Lucero, yes. state your advice. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I just wanted to say hi to the cutie pie that Representative uh, Howard has in his hands there. I have had the opportunity to review the amendment and the bill, and I find the point of order well taken. There are no further amendments at the desk. The clerk will give the bill its third reading. Third reading, House file number 403. Third reading. Discussion to the bill. The member from Fillmore, Representative Davids. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Uh, I never went to law school. I said I wanted to do something much more honorable. I wanted to be a politician. Um, so I never, never went to law school, but I've had a lot of attorneys work for me. Uh, over the years, I've hired a lot of them over the years. Uh, and I have always, with my employees, paid the same wage regardless of gender. Always. And I think this bill will help that issue because I truly believe uh, that equal work deserves equal pay. Uh, and so I rise today. I, I wish the Scott Amendment had gone on and the Lucero ones too, but especially the Scott Amendment, I think she's absolutely right. But I think as this moves forward, uh, that issue can be worked on. But members, as for today, uh, I think we should put up green votes on this. I think the base part of this bill does some uh, very, very good things. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Discussion to the bill. The member from Hennepin, Representative Robbins. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, members. Thank you, Representative Herr. You've been working on this bill since last session, and I've um, had the privilege of sitting in the Judiciary Committee listening to this debate f since last session. And I wish the Scott Amendment would have gone on. There still would have been ample ways um, for people to file suit without the rebuttable presumption, and I think that really matters. Um, so I probably will be voting against this. But the other thing that I've raised repeatedly in committee that I, I don't seem to get traction on, so I'm just going to raise it here, is that in line 1.11, it says um, the employer cannot even consider uh, pay history from any source. And that is just so broad, members. And that's the other concern I have about this bill, in addition to the rebuttable presumption. I don't know how you prove what an employer considered or did not consider, but I think it's very difficult um, to have that word in the bill. And from any source is also so unnecessarily broad. I, I so wish this was a bill where it said you cannot ask people's uh, salary. And if the employer asked it, then it would be very clear cut. But this is not the case with this bill, and I just, I'm afraid that it's much too broad, even though I really strongly support the intention of it. So I hope that going forward, Representative Her, you will continue to think about taking out the rebuttable presumption and that you will also please consider getting rid of the words consider and any source. Thank you. The member from Douglas, Representative Franson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm sorry, I'm having major internet problems today. Um, say, I just want to speak on this bill too, and on the amendment that Representative Scott brought forward, the ability for two parents to co-parent and for the par uh, the children to know the parents and be able to have equal access to each parent is very important, as well as Representative Lucero's amendment putting vaccination status into the human rights code. Members, we're talking about employment issues here. And there are companies that offer very well right now and deliberating whether or not employers have the ability to fire those that do not choose to be vaccinated with the COVID-19 vaccination. This is a slippery rope. What Representative Lucero is trying to do is to come in front of the problem 
instead of us reacting to the problem later on. He wants to be proactive instead of most of lawmaking is reactive. He sees a problem and he wants to react to that issue. Members in Florida, Governor DeSantis has said, yes, the COVID vaccination task force is a problem. He does not support. Meanwhile, in Connecticut, Connecticut State is saying, you know what? COVID vaccination passports or vaccination uh, passports is probably likely to um, regaining any freedoms that you once had in our state. We see this as something that is on the horizon here in Minnesota. As you know, Governor Wall still holds those emergency powers. And as long as he does so, he can also make by edict rules that say if you want to go to a Twins game, start showing the fact that you've been vaccinated. Those types of situations we are trying to come in front of. We should not be creating two classes of people in the state of Minnesota, of those who choose to be injected and those who do not choose to be injected. Members, that's what Representative Lucero was trying to accomplish. I'm actually very disturbed and saddened that we were not able to have a healthy, robust discussion. He also has this, these amendments that he brought forward. He actually has legislation for it. It wasn't just some mamsy pamsy fly on the whim, let's throw out an amendment to trick you guys. He has legislation he has introduced. It has not had a hearing. Members, these are issues that we as policy leaders need to discuss. Thank you. The member from Wabasha, Representative Driskowski. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, Democrats in the House, your uh, progressive roots, branches, leaves, and other elements of the plant are showing. We know that progressivism is a front door to communism. The takeover of businesses by government. I've heard this discussion, Madam Speaker, members in this bill and also the bill brought forward by Representative Carlson and Representative Olson. Each of them is doing the same thing, having government take over and dictate an element of business that belongs not to the government, but to the employers and the employees in those businesses. We are robbing the freedoms of the marketplace, of the people who are building this country and built this state, and we are knocking them down to their knees. As was, as was outlined earlier, uh, Governor Walz with his dictates have knocked them down flat on the floor. They're trying to get up and Democrats are coming with tax increases in the first bill, with uh, forcing people to rehire uh, people, whether they're performers or not in the second bill. And now a bill that even does more of the same, controlling uh, the, the marketplace of employment. Members, what are we doing here? This is not government's role. Um, I find it very amusing that uh, members advocating for these bills, including this one, bring forward the notion and talk about and argue uh, that different provisions in the bill will be the right things to do for businesses. The reality is members, you don't know what is right for somebody's business. Neither does the government. The government is non-discriminating in their carrying forward of the machinery that we're placing in front of them to chew up Minnesota's businesses that are trying to succeed in the face of all these obstacles that this dictatorial governor and this uh, legislature, the House Democrats are bent on bringing forward socialism, controlling the means of production in this state and bringing forward a, a, a situation that provides for equal suffering for everybody. We know socialism has been tried many, many times across this planet. It has never failed. It has never succeeded. It's going to fail again. We got to stop this incremental approach to socialism. Stop this bill. Madam Speaker, let's vote no. The member from Hennepin, Representative Bonner. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, 
Representative Hur for bringing this bill forward. What we're talking about here today is equal pay for equal work. You know, they did, I watched an experiment recently where they had children and they had two tubes of balls. They had one little boy and one little girl. They filled those tubes with balls and one clearly had more than the other. They asked the children whether or not that was fair. And they clearly agreed that it was not. And in fact, this very kind little boy took balls out of his own tube and put them into the other tube to make them even. If children can understand the concept of equal pay for equal work, surely as legislators and lawmakers, we can understand that as well. Many of you in this chamber know that I've spoken previously about my experience with pay discrimination and the loss of nearly a hundred thousand dollars even though I worked in a position in which I had more years of experience, more years at the company, more responsibility, and more teams, and yet still made $20,000 a year less than my male counterparts. And when we looked at a deeper dive, we found that 90% of my department who were women were all making less. That's just not equitable. And I think we all know that. And what's really important to keep in mind is that as we continue down the road that we are, we've come to a place in time where we understand that equity in work, paying people equally for doing the same job is the right thing to do. We understand that this is how the world works. And, and I just wanna tell you that there was a, a number of CEOs who were recently asked about this. Um, Jennifer Hyman, the CEO of Rent the Runway said this, she said, unless business leaders understand the future of their employee base is not willing to accept the unequal environment that has perpetuated in the past, they are not going to be around for the future. But more importantly, when we ask them about the challenges behind whether or not this is actually something that we can do, is it something within our power to do? They asked this very pointed question of the CEO of Salesforce.com, right, Mark Benoit. And he blatantly said that every CEO needs to look at whether they're paying men and women the same. That is something every single CEO can do today. He said, all, we all have modern human resource management system, but as CEOs, are you willing to step up and say that I pay men and women the same. Members, children understand this concept. This is not a tough call today. Please vote green. Seeing no further discussion, the author of the bill, the member from Ramsey, Representative Her. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And thank you for the discussion today. Um, I just wanted to address a couple of really uh, small things. There are a couple of members brought up the difficulty of how an employer would prove they didn't um, use somebody's past pay. And so I've had the privilege of interviewing and hiring numerous people. And what I do is I put a rubric together of the education I said you needed and the experience that I said you needed and the all of the requirements. And then I set up what, how much each one is ranked and my pay range. and. I set up a little rubric that tells me if somebody has certain number of years and different things where they might fall in that pay range. That is all documentation that I keep because I never know when somebody's going to come back and see and ask if I treated them fairly in the process. All of those things are things you can submit to show that you were fair in how you, uh, you screened empl uh, potential employees and uh, why you offered what you did. And so it's actually quite easy to show that you didn't just use somebody's past pay to uh, base their new pay on. Also to the point of controlling marketplace and employment, boy, that was really interesting to hear because businesses already have control of everything they do within their business and just asking them not to discriminate against somebody using their pay is not controlling how they run their business and who they can hire and what they hire. 
Businesses do market research to determine pay range. They decide the education level needed for a job. They decide how much experience you need. They decide the, number, the experience that you should have. They decide all of the other factors that they're going to choose to use to hire somebody. Asking them not to consider pay, just as we ask them not to consider race and gender. If somebody is of childbearing age or if somebody's pregnant or might be pregnant, we ask for people not to use those and, they, and it is not okay to use those either. And so we're just adding one more category to this so that we can try to close that pay gap. So I just wanna leave us with this. Yesterday, March 23rd, was equal pay day. This signifies how far into 2021 a woman would have had to work in order to earn what a man made in all of 2020. That's 82 days, members. In the year 2021, a woman still must work 82 more days in a year just to earn the same wage as a man. And as, close, and as I close, I also want to thank my fellow co-authors as well as the members who have voted for this bill in committee. I ask that you know, we make this uh, a vote that really looks at equal pay for all people and that we can, become one, we, can, we can move one step closer to closing the pay gap in Minnesota. Thank you. The clerk will take the roll on the bill. Members voting remotely, please vote. Will the clerk please call the roll of those who have not voted yet? <clears throat> Bo. Bo, no. Bo, no. Feist. Feist, aye. Feist, aye. Franzen. Franzen votes no. Franzen, no. Frazier. Frazier, aye. Gomez. Gomez, aye. Gomez, aye. Grunhagen. Grunhagen, no. Grunhagen, no. Hausman. Hausman, aye. Hausman, aye. Heinrich. Heinrich, no. Heinrich, no. Heinzman. <clears throat> Heinzman. Heinzman, no. Heinzman, no. Hurtas. Hurtas, no. Hurtas, no. Mariani. Mariani, aye. Mariani, aye. Mason. Mason, aye. Mason, aye. Moran. Moran, aye. Moran, aye. Nelson, N. Nelson N, no. Nelson N, no. Noor. Noor, I. Noor, I. Pearson. Pearson, I. Pearson, I. Swazinski. Swazinski, no. Swazinski, no. The clerk will close the roll. There being 80 ayes and 51 nays, the bill is passed and its title agreed to.